I drive through my neighborhood in Beirut, Lebanon frequently as I visit Cedar Home students and other community members. Recently, every time I've gone out, I saw a teenage boy next to the community garbage bins. His name is Muhammad, he's 13. As I watched, people dropped off their garbage and recycling, and he would sort through each bag looking for anything of value. He told me that this is the job given to him by his dad, sorting through garbage to help provide for the family. He's not in school, he's not learning any valuable skills, he's not being prepared to thrive once he is an adult. But in Lebanon, as the economic crisis continues, nothing else seems possible. My name is Karim Anaisi, and I'm a missionary with Fellowship International in Lebanon. I've been serving at Cedar Home for Girls as the executive director since 2012, for many years, I've been holding on to a dream to help boys like Muhammad. Many years ago, Cedar Home was located outside of the city, but the girls and staff were forced to evacuate because of the Lebanese civil war and relocated to its current building in Beirut. The old building has been mostly abandoned to this day, but it still stands waiting to be useful again. It's a house with good bones. I long for the day that this building is full again, full of the sounds of boys laughing, teachers going through their lessons, mentors teaching valuable trade skills, and the good news of Jesus being shared. I dream of a space where boys grow into men who love Jesus and are equipped to help the people of Lebanon grow and thrive into the nation they long to be. This dream can become a reality. Through the Good Bones Special Appeal, we are seeking to raise $150,000. Funds raised will go towards the completion of repairs and renovations and furnishing the revitalized school building so that it is ready to accept both residential and non-residential students into this program to help boys be ready to thrive. With your help, we can take this all but forgotten building and make it a bustling and vibrant home where youth discover Jesus and find new purpose in life. Like the boys, this Cedar Home will house. It has good bones. It just needs a little help to get started. And we are moving along very well in our mission project. So thank you for your generosity and continue uh, to give to the Good Bones Project, both in the East Coast and in Lebanon. And you can make your payment payable to Calvary Baptist Church and we'll make sure that the funds get forwarded to the various ministries. Well, welcome to our service this morning. So good to have you with us here, those joining us online as well. A couple of announcements that I want to highlight this morning. You'll notice behind me that this set is moving along very nicely. We still need some decorators, painters, that kind of thing. Speak to Pastor Jordan or Pastor Steve. Also, ticket order forms are available right after the service in the lobby. So uh, take advantage of that. Order tickets for your family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and let's fill up the presentation that's coming up. Jingle in the City, we're looking so forward to that, December 9th through 11th, so mark that on your calendars. Also, tonight we'll be having our fall meeting, so come on back tonight at 7.30 uh, for our congregational meeting. Also, shoe boxes still available for Samaritan's Purse, uh, Christmas Child. Pick those up, uh, we need them back by next Sunday, so take note of that. And then uh, finally, um, so glad to be able to publish and announce the bands of marriage between Savannah Nicole Hooper and Nicholas Gage Young, who will be married in Niagara-on-the-Lake on Saturday, November 19th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, afternoon. So we rejoice in the announcement of that upcoming marriage. Pastor Dwight.
Well, would you stand with us and uh, let's together worship our great God and declare to him today that all we need, all we want, all we have is in Christ alone. It's found in Jesus alone, all right? So let's lift a shout of praise this morning and sing to him, for he is worthy of our praise. Amen, church. Amen. Let's sing.
Praise God. I hope that is your testimony this morning, that your life has been changed by the grace that the Father has extended to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? And uh, isn't it wonderful that we can enjoy a personal relationship with Jesus? He is mine. What an awesome position we have today because of God's grace in our lives. So let's go to Him in prayer and continue to give Him all the glory and all the credit. Father, we just want to thank You for Your love for us. Even while we were yet sinners, you sent Christ to die for us. Father, we just gather here this morning as your people to say thank you. Thank you so much for changing our lives. Thank you for rescuing us from the domain of darkness and bringing us into the kingdom of your son, the kingdom of light. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being willing to obey the Father's will for your life and to go to the cross on our behalf so that we can be here this morning and be able to have a relationship with God the Father and to be able to know that our sins are forgiven. We will never face, God, your wrath for our sins. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our hearts are so full of gratitude and joy and appreciation this morning. And I pray that that would be evident in every aspect of the service through our singing, through our giving, through the preaching of your word. Father, I just pray that we will reveal to you that we have come this morning with hearts of gratitude because we acknowledge that you are the one who has done this all by your grace through faith in Christ alone. Thank you so much. And Father, we just thank you for the privilege you now give us as your ambassadors of your kingdom to share this good news that people's lives can be changed with our community. And so, Father, we, we stand here today and we look at the set that is being prepared and we thank you for the many gifted people in our congregation who have contributed to helping that get ready. We think of our choir and our musicians, Lord, and we just pray, God, that you would be pre pre preparing hearts in our community, draw people to come and hear the good news that Jesus came to save those who were lost. Father, I just pray that you'd help us to work hard to get invitations out. And I pray that you'd grant us favor with those that we invite. And Lord, we just pray that you have said in your word that the fields are white for harvest, but the workers are few. God, we pray that we will be busy about working in the fields that are ready to be harvested for your kingdom over this next month and a half. So God, we commit this season to you. We ask God that you would be glorified, that you glorify yourself by drawing many men, women, boys and girls to yourself during this Christmas season. Father, thank you that you are a good father. You know every need that we have represented in this congregation this morning as well as those who are watching online. And God, we just bring a few of our family members before you this morning who you are fully aware are struggling with some sickness right now. We think specifically of Ivan and Fern. We think of Winnie and Rhoda. For Guy, for Marjorie, Susanna, for Ray, Sam, and Carolyn. Father, thank you that you're with them. Thank you that your spirit lives in them. And we ask that you would strengthen them physically today. We ask that you'd guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. Father, would you restore them so that they can gather again with us and worship you together. So we commit them to you and the caregivers and their family, extended family that are caring for them. God, give them strength, give them patience during these days as you walk with them. Father, we also pray today specifically for Dave McFall and his family on the home going of his mom. Father, thank you for giving his mom the gift of faith to believe in Jesus Christ. Thank you that her faith has become sight this week and she is in your presence. Would you just comfort Dave and the family during these days of grief? And Father, thank you that we don't have to mourn as those who have no hope because we do have hope hope. And so, Father, we lift this family up to you. We thank you for our mission partners around the world. Father, we think of this project that you've invited us to participate with you on, the Good Bones Project. Lord, help us to be faithful to reach that target and go above and beyond. Everything, Lord, that we have is from you. So help us to live with open hands and generous hearts. So, Lord, bless the Good Bones Project. We also pray for our missionary family today, represented by the kings in Birmingham, England. Father, look after them, bless them, and for the specific people group that they are reaching in Birmingham, God, would you give them open doors, gospel conversations, so that people will hear the message of Jesus Christ. Bless them, look after them, and provide for their needs that they have. We also think of our Freedom Global Outreach partners in Haiti who minister to uh, orphans. Lord, I just ask that you would bless them, provide for them what they need for these young boys and girls. And most of all, God, I pray that many boys and girls through their practical care of caring
caring for orphans will come to know you as their heavenly father. And so, Lord, we just commit the rest of this service to you, and we ask your blessing upon every aspect. And, Lord, as Pastor Rick brings your word to us this morning, I pray that you would penetrate our hearts. I pray that you'd continue to change us, continue to make us more into the image of your son. Bless him as he shares this morning. We love you. Thank you for being so generous with us. As we worship you with our tithes and offerings, we give back to you what is rightfully yours and pray that you would continue to use it to expand your kingdom here in Oshawa and around the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen. Well, church, you know, the world is constantly bombarding us with the message of more. You need more and more, more things, bigger houses, better financial stability, more free time. But as children of the living God, we know that Christ is enough. He is enough for us. He's all we need. He's all we have. He's all we'll ever need. So let's declare that to ourselves, to Him. Let's sing it. Christ is my
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. That truth that we stand righteous before him and therefore spotless before his throne is an awesome reality of our salvation, isn't it? That we are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ so that God sees our sins no more and sees us as his children, spotless as the Lamb of God before his throne. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, how we thank you and praise you. And we love you. We thank you for what you've done for us in Christ Jesus. How you have taken away our sins, covered us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that we are able to stand before your throne forgiven, loved, forever and eternally in your presence. Oh God, what a tremendous promise that is. And I pray, Lord, as we turn our attention to your word this morning, that we will live up to that great reality, that great position we have in Christ in our lives practically every day. Lord, make us more and more like Christ. Cause our affections to incline to to you, to things above, O oh Lord, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Oh, how we love you, and oh, how you love us, and we thank you for that. We pray now that you will bless us by the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives through your word to us today, in Jesus' name, amen. If you are new with us, uh, pop by our connections room on your way out. Say hi to one of our pastors or two of our pastors, whoever there. Uh, we'd love to get to know you and meet you. And we're, we're grateful that you're here with us. Every day, in fact, virtually every minute of every day, a cold war rages for control of you. I don't know if you think much about that, but everything that's going on in your life, everything that's going on around you, everything that's going on to you, is seeking to control you, to shape you, to determine how you think, how you act, to vie for your loyalty, your affections, for your very soul, we have an ongoing reality around us as we continue to witness the mass psycho psychosis over fear in our world. How social engineering works, the powerful use of social pressure to shape behavior, how the perverse sex industry confounds the minds, especially of men, by juxtaposing beauty and evil, it confounds our minds. Because we, by nature, connect beauty and goodness. And this world places beauty, particularly in the minds of men, beautiful women juxtaposed to evil acts to confound our minds, to control us. Emotions and feelings are displacing truth. Your phone is listening to you every minute. Just say something about a boat or a car. You'll have ads pop up. It's like the unholy spirit of your life. It, it is. It really is. Distorting your thinking. Distorting any critical thinking that you might yet have is being dismantled. And all of these practical things that we're facing 
were similar to the Colossians. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 3 this morning? They were being faced with religious compromise, replacement experiences, hollow human philosophies. What's different about that than now? Not much, really. And so as they discovered that these things were impossible to tame the rebellious soul, we asked the question today, well, then what will? What will be able to counteract what is going on in our lives? What, what can change us and help us? How can we make the most of our time considering the days are evil, as Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5.16? What counter strategy is needed? Well, I would submit to you that it's found right here in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. How Christian life succeeds right here in these four verses. This will enable you to overcome the compulsion and enable you to resist worldly ideas and lifestyles and embrace godly ones. But the question that you have to face this morning is how badly do you want this? How badly do you want to overcome these, these social engineering experiences that are trying to steal your soul away, how badly do you want to counteract that through the power and presence of the Spirit of God in your life? Because it matters. It matters how badly you want this. Passive Christianity won't cut it, beloved. It simply won't. The pressure on you every minute of the day is too great for passive Christianity to succeed. You have to engage in this. So, so listen to how Paul writes to the Colossians. He's right in between. This kind of now turns the, the he's talking, talk, first of all, he has spoken of great theological truths about Christ and our sufficiency in Christ. And then he's addressed the great problem in Colossae. And now he's about to give the practical response to how to deal with the fact that, the, that Christ is ultimately sufficient and every day of your lives you're being pressured to disbelieve that, now what do you do? Colossians 3, verse 1. Since then, or it could be translated if then, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, or because you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I know you're getting probably exhausted by hearing me say the same thing, but this is one of the great texts of Scripture. This is one of the apexes of God's truth to us. It's just awesome what God is saying to us and, and what he is telling you this morning, what he's telling you and me. So please listen with all of your ears. God says, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Do you have ears to hear today? I, I trust you. I know you do. But this is how Christian life succeeds. More important than what's in your wallet is what's in your head. What do you believe? What do you believe in your heart? What do you know? If you are a Christian, and there are fakes, but if you are a Christian, this morning, this powerful collection of truths is for you. Christ took your sin-addicted self to the cross, and you died. 2.20. You were made alive. 2.13. Raised with Christ. 3.1. To have permanent access to God's resurrecting power to live for Christ by being hidden with Christ in God. 3-3. Three, three. That, that 
collection of facts is the most powerful juxtap juxtaposition of truth that you can ever put together. And Paul is literally saying in verse 1 of chapter 3, if this is true of you, okay, since, the word since there means if, if this is true, in other words, these things that have gone before predicate, they, they come before your ability to do the things that he's calling you to do. If you've been raised with Christ, which is a requirement before you can do these things, if you've been raised with Christ, then do something about it. Do something significant about it. If you have been raised with Christ, if you had died to your sin, died to your life, and have been raised to Christ, then do something about it, something very radical about it. That's what he's telling us here. And in so doing something radical about it, you are proving that you've been raised with Christ, okay? It works as kind of circular. You need this to do this, and if you do this, it's because you have this. That's how it works, okay? So, what do we need to do first? The NIV says, set your hearts on things above. It really is stating to us, keep seeking things above, okay? That's the command, that's the exhortation. That's the literal translation. Keep seeking things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. It's stunning. I mean, get a fresh vision, Paul says, of who you are and what you have and who you know. You, you, are, um, you are invited here to be lifted to the crib of God, okay? Where he is. This is who you are. To seek to hang there. It's your hood. This is who you are and where you are. This is a, you know, you, you will get swamped in the muck and mud and mire of your cell phone and media mind platforms, media mind storms, unless you seek daily, moment by moment, a lofty vision of who you are and what you're to seek. And you're to seek certain realities, he says here. Seek things above. What are these above things? Well, look what he says here. Seek the things above where Christ is. Get your mind up on the things of Christ, the things of God, where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. You and I know personally the God of this universe. You get up every, you get up every morning just reminding yourself of who you know. And we all want to know celebrities. Guess who I met? Guess who I saw the other day? I saw Dougie Gilmore at a hockey game last night. Wow. Get up every morning and say, I know God. <laughs> Does it get bigger than that? I, I happen to, you know, you're just going to work. I, I, you know, hey, I happen to know God. They, they're talking about, oh, I know this person. Well, I happen to know God. That's what Paul's saying. You, you have been raised into the very presence of God. Every minute of your life, that's who you are. That's a reality. We, we live in this, this, this world of, of religion now. This, as long as it's the idea of God that matters. It's the idea of God. As long as you, you have the idea of God and it makes you feel good, that, that, then that's what's really good about it. That's not what's really good about it. This isn't just an idea. God is a real person. God is the real creator of the universe. God is the almighty God of the universe. This is the reality of above things that we are to seek 
constantly to keep seeking God. And notice Christ who's seated. He's sitting there. The posture of a job done. Your salvation work, the work of salvation for you is done. That's why Christ is seated. It's, a, it's, a, it's an illustration, a metaphor, a, a picture of, of Christ being finished with the work that he came to do for you. There's nothing more that you need to do to earn your salvation. There's, there's no more works that you need to do. Every day that you wake up, all that's been needed to be done is done by the Christ who's seated at the right hand of God for you. And he's at the right hand of God, which is a quote right out of Psalm 110, which is the psalm most quoted in the New Testament. It's a spectacular psalm, Psalm 110. Listen to what the psalmist says. Psalm 110, the Lord, this is David. This was used when Jesus was, was silencing the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and their foolishness and their lack of theological understanding, which was their job to know. He said, insulted Jesus by their ignorance. Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. It talks about what to expect, who to expect, it's not really hidden. It says here, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord has sworn in verse 4, he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The king, priest, Messiah, who they were to expect. And Paul says, this is the one who's sitting at the right hand of God, the one promised. And, and again, the right hand of God is a, a metaphor, another illustration, another picture, not of location as much as power. The right hand of God is the power place of God. Over all authorities, Paul says, wake up every morning and you got all of this noise around you trying to steal away your mind and your heart and your thoughts and shape you and change your direction, all of this. Wait a second, you have been raised with Christ to where he is, seated, finished his work for you, at the right hand, the all-powerful place over all the universe with God, the real God. Does that dry out your wood this morning and light a fire for you? Because it sure did for me this week as I look at this and I think what we have to the personality cult around us, we are hanging with the greatest if we put our attention into it, freed from worldly affections to have new affections in a new direction, the realm, direction where Christ now and forever reigns so that the eternal realities of the age to come can shape our life plans, how you aim your life. We, we are to keep seeking what we long for, beloved. We are to keep seek, seeking where we are going we are to keep seeking so we plan for our eternal future. At our house, when a vacation rolls around, the whole house changes. Suitcases are out. They're laying around. There's stuff being wa The washing machine is going full blast because you couldn't possibly put a pair of shorts you wore once in with a group of clothing that is clean for vacation. Like, I don't understand it, so if I've worn it once, I wear it that day so I can wear it twice. But anyway, that's the way it is in our house. You, there's like a flurry of activity going on in anticipation for where we are going. And we, you know, for, for some of us, you may need to go to the gym for a while or, or you go to the tanning salon for a couple of weeks to get prepared so you don't go down there pasty white and everybody notices you and you burn the first day you get there and all that kind of stuff, right? The doctors are saying to me, stop telling people that stuff. That's bad stuff. But anyway, the gym isn't. The gym's a good thing. But you get ready, the diet change, you acclimate yourself. We're, we're going somewhere more spectacular, everyone. Our future is a lot different than a vacation. How much preparation is going on in your life for this? 
Paul is calling you, raised with Christ. Keep seeking where you're going. And the age to come breaks into your life every day that way. And you start to take shape. You, you shape yourself. God is shaping you by his Holy Spirit into where you are, really. This is what we're looking for. Well, that doesn't leave a whole lot for me to say in the second point here. Set your minds on things above, does it? I mean, it doesn't get more lofty, I think, than what I just said to you, but saturate your heart for where you really are. And, and he next says, set your mind on what is on the mind of Christ. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. Yes, I want to seek after the implications of these great lofty realities that we've just rehearsed. But how do I need to think now on above things? Not on earthly things. Not on the things that have jeopardized your eternity in the first place. Stop thinking on those things. Stop thinking on the things that are there. How much of our mind space is hijacked and occupied by earthly things that don't matter and won't last? Things that are perishing. That puts us in the category of thinking like people who don't even know Jesus. That's how they think. The people who who don't know Christ around you, that, that's all they think about is earthly things. What sets us apart is different, and how badly, how badly do we want to succeed in the Christian life? It's about changing the way you think. Thinking on things that offer eternal value to me. Do you know more sports statistics than Bible verses? Are you a champion at video games? But you're not really certain how you could even tell anybody about Jesus Christ? That would go down as the category of earthly things rather than things above. That's why Paul wrote to the Romans and said, stop being conformed to this world. Stop it, because you are passively, if not actively, being conformed to what you spend most of your time thinking about. Rather, he says, be transformed. How? How? by the renewing of your mind. He's saying the same thing to the Colossians here. Think on things above. Spend all kinds of time thinking about things above. You're being socially engineered to think about the things of this world to think about the things that the power brokers of our world are trying to direct you to think about. Say no. Resist it. Think on things above. And this is, this kind of thinking is the thinking that, that Paul again was talking about when he said, have this attitude or mind which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2.5. It's the Christ mind. It's thinking like Christ. We're called to cultivate inner priorities in our lives, like Jesus. Priorities of Christ. To refuse to allow my mind or your mind to be persuaded to downgrade the standards of Jesus Christ in your thinking because that's that's the the strategy of the enemy if he can't steal us away from Christ which he can't 
He will seek to downgrade your thinking so that most of the time you're spending your thinking about earthly things rather than things above. And in so doing, you will start to be persuaded to downgrade your thinking about the standards of Jesus Christ because you've abandoned thinking about the things of Christ. And you stop remembering what Christ has taught us. And we will start to be attracted to the smooth sounding arguments of those who don't know Christ. They will start to make sense to us because we have abandoned thinking on things above. This is why churches, church leaders, are downgrading their theology. Because they're spending more time listening to the mind of the earth, the people of the earth, than they are on the mind of Christ. That will take you in the wrong direction. You will start to base your theology on your feelings and on your emotions and on the persuasive arguments of others. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, that sounds nice. Satan's not opposed to us thinking like that. Yeah, that even sounds compassionate. Satan gives a hip hip hooray on that one to downgrade the truth of the gospel for compassion, to trade the truth of Jesus for compassion. Satan gives a hip hip hooray on that one. That's his strategy. He will call it compassion and he will call it good marketing because after all, the job of the church is to attract people to come to it. So, let's make Jesus easier to come to. We ought to check in with Jesus first. Mind of Christ we're talking about here. Listen, the truth of the matter is this. If people are ever going to turn to Jesus Christ, it is because they're looking for something completely different from what they already have. Don't let anybody persuade you any differently than that. Jesus won't be downgraded in order to be received. And the truth is anyway, people are already done with their lives when they're turning to Jesus. They're looking for something completely different. That's why, beloved, we must not waver from thinking on things above, like the mind of Christ. Feed your mind for who you really have become. Selective feeding for righteous mind space. This is the bread of life, God's word. Listen to reliable teaching. That's what makes all the difference in the world. And he puts all of the, these two exhortations, these two commands, he wraps them up in a, in a because statement. Notice in your, in your Bible, verse 3, it says, for or because. Why do I give myself entirely to seeking things above? Why do I give myself to thinking on things above? Because I have died because Christ is my life. Do you see this? Because you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ who is your life, verse 4. Can I whisper something in your ears? The Christian life isn't about you or your life. Oh, man. That hurt. It isn't. The Christian life is not about you and your life. Well, what about my life? What about me? Newsflash. You died. 
<laughs> How many times does this have to be said in the New Testament before we get it straight? I have been crucified with Christ. Next, I no longer live. The life I live, I now live by faith in Jesus Christ who died for me, who gave his life for me. So we live, but it's a different life. You died, I died. If you know Christ, you died. You've already, the worst has already happened to you in your life. I, John Piper said this so well. The worst for you and me as believers in Christ has already happened. We say, well, wait a minute. I, I got some things ahead of me, I think, that are... No, no. You were lost and you died to Christ. And now you will live forever. The death you will die physically is an instant access into the very presence of God forever. So it's not about us. We've been purchased by Christ out of an eternally perilous situation and brought into the marvelous kingdom of his life to live an immeasurably better life now like nothing we will experience later in him. So what exactly is this hidden then? Okay, we'll wrap it up with this. What exactly is this hidden that we're talking about here, that Paul's talking about? Well, it certainly means, positionally, that you are secure and protected and kept, wi hidden with Christ in God. No question about that. You are loved, all of that. But it means more than that. That's your position. But what practically does this mean to us? That we are now hidden with Christ. Well, increasingly the old me, which was drowning in me, and you were drowning in you, is now increasingly slipping behind Jesus so that more and more, only Christ is visible. We are becoming more and more like him, more and more like Christ. We are disappearing, practically. It certainly means that, to increasingly reflect him. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it certainly means that. But what it importantly means in this text is that almost entirely the new me, who I really am, the, the glory of Christ in me, is unseen by people. In fact, unseen by us. We, we're wearing this morning glory camo. I, I can't see the glory of Christ in you based on what's theologically really true about the glory of Christ. Do you remember the Mount of Transfiguration, anybody? Do you remember what happened to Jesus as the disciples were gazing at him? And what was inside of him started to show on the outside and this blazing, brilliant reality was before their very eyes? And Peter's like, this is good, Lord. It is good for us to be here. Let's just stay here. And then it went away. Because even the glory of Christ is not visible to this world. Why? Because God has permitted the God of this world to blind the eyes of people to the glory of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. The God of this age has been permitted to blind the minds of unbelievers 
so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Except to the ones he unblinds, like you and me. And has enabled us to see the glory of the gospel in Jesus Christ. But even now, that glory is hidden to us in its fullness, as it was to the disciples. And we don't see him. In fact, Peter makes an important point in 1 Peter, you, though you, you have not seen him, and, but though you have not seen him, you love him. In John 12, 40, the question is answered, why don't people come in mass to Jesus? Why not? Because it says there that, that God has blinded them lest they see and understand and turn and are healed. He decides who. But in the meantime, right now, the old unhealthy life of me and you is increasingly disappearing behind Christ until only Christ is visible. But, but listen, the glory of your transformation and my transformation being mostly hidden now bursts forth in blinding brilliance at the time of Christ's appearing. He wraps up this section with this spectacular truth where he says what, what John says in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared yet what we shall be. Now we are children of God, but not yet have we appeared in the form that we will appear in. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be revealed as well. Now what, what is this all about? The, the glory of the coming of Christ the glory of our translation into his presence. Now we are hidden. You say, wait a second. I thought, I thought Jesus said in the Beatitudes, which we just preached not too long ago, that let your light so shine that people might see the, the good, by your good works, uh, uh, that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I, I thought Jesus taught that. Yeah, yeah, he did teach that. And from time to time, in little ways, there are little glimpses that people notice and, and do glorify your Father. But you know in your life and my life, most of our days we spend, why isn't anybody noticing Christ in me? Why isn't anybody asking me about Jesus? In fact, I look at myself in the mirror and I think, oh Lord, I have failed you so many times. I've failed you more than I can imagine. I, I fail you in thought. I fail you in action. I fail you in unconscious ways. I'm so discouraged. I'm not sure I even see the glory of Christ in me that is supposed to be here. And Paul says, that's because it's mostly hidden. If it wasn't hidden, this world could not handle Calvary Baptist Church. So brilliant would the glory of Christ be that we would be a blazing blob in front of them that they couldn't take in, beloved. But when Christ appears, we will see him as he is. And what has not yet appeared in us what we shall be, we will be when Christ appears because of who he is. C.S. Lewis said, so great will the glory be then that we will be tempted to worship each other now, you know what he means. We'll be so sanctified that thought wouldn't even enter our mind, of course. He's drawing the picture here, beloved. What we're looking at today, looking at each other, look around, look around. Do you, just, do you see this brilliance? No, you do not. Are you discouraged because you don't see it in your life more? Yes, you are, because I am. But don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged, beloved. Keep 
Keep after the things above. Keep seeking the things above. Keep thinking about above things. Because right now you're hidden. The glory of Christ is hidden. But when he appears, and he will, that's another of the realities that Paul lays out here. Jesus is coming again. And the final reality is, you are going to shine like the stars. And let, let, can I just read in closing Daniel chapter 12, just one verse, because this is an Old Testament promise of the fulfillment of what Paul is stating here. Listen, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's the glorious truth of the gospel, beloved. That's what makes this so amazing. Getting our practice to where we already are in position. You are already seated with Christ. Your mind is already the mind of Christ. You are already warehousing the glory of Christ and his brilliance. That's what's true. And it requires total commitment and cooperation in embracing all of the spiritual benefits that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. And John writes after verse 2, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Will you join with each other in counteracting the passive subsuming of your lives by the culture and finally take your place where you really are in Christ and, act, and, and actively pursue the glories of Jesus Christ in your life. The active behavior, beloved, this is of really, really believing. Oh, Lord God. Wow. Just wow. Thank you. Thank you for your word, your promises, the pictures you give to us. Now, Lord, by the motivating work of your Holy Spirit, may it be made so in our lives, I pray. For Jesus' sake and his glory. Amen. Well, church, would you stand with us? Let's together respond to our great God, celebrating the risen Christ. Let's sing to him now.
I want to uh, share something with you uh, before we leave this morning. <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I informed the pastors and deacons that this, my 22nd year, would be my last as senior pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, Oshawa, Ontario. So I began my time here as senior pastor in September 2001. And if the Lord allows, I'll complete in September 2023. It's hard to believe, but I will be 67 years old this year and almost 68 by this time next year. I believe this is the ideal time for Calvary to have younger leadership. We're healthy and we're growing. Praise the Lord how we thank Him for that. We're adding new mem many new people, new members. We have a fantastic and stable leadership team of veterans and young staff members. We're in a great financial situation with the Lord's blessing. We'll be completely out of debt at the end of this year. Several million dollars of upgrades during these last several years and the purchase of 301 being owned free and clear. Praise God for all of that. And there are presently no major issues causing us any problems, I praise the Lord for that. We're not in the middle of some major project that would require my attention. And it's really just a blessed time for our church. To God be the glory, all the glory. And it's the right time, I believe, to make a change. Because we have such a great leadership team, we're in a strong position to have this team continue the journey and to take over. So upon my giving notice of completing my role here, our entire leadership, pastors and deacons, were unanimous in affirming Pastor Kelvin Caulfield to become the next lead pastor of Calvary Baptist Church. become effective next September 2023. And the leadership would like me to remain in a mentorship role for a little bit to assist Pastor Kelvin in a smooth transition of leadership. Of course, there are more details to come, which we don't have. We haven't worked through any details, really. I haven't worked through any details, including your involvement in the process of this transition. We'll bring those details forward to you when we have them, but for now we wanted you to have a good amount of notice of our succession vision. Thank you for your prayers and the privilege of my life to be your pastor all these years. It has truly been a blessing, 
and I shall treasure every one of the last months remaining and promise to give you my very, very best right to the very end. My beloved church, God richly bless you all. One of the verses that is, was my life, life, more of my life verse when I was a lot younger and didn't think this would come so quickly was Psalm 71, verse 18. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. As I witnessed a wedding this past Friday of two kids that were not even born or barely born when I started here, I realize that God has fulfilled this promise to me. When I listen to them speak of their Christ-centered lives, I realize that God has enabled me to be a part of handing off to the next generation a passion for Jesus Christ. That has always been my, my desire and my hope. So I thank you all. God bless you.